as bards. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us here this evening as family. Thank you for keeping this church open, this chapel, this place of peace and quiet, Father, that we can just come in fellowship together and break bread and be refreshed and re-energized. Father, we're just so grateful for your grace, your mercy, your love in our lives. We do pray for those in the congregation that can't be here this evening to enjoy this time with us. And we pray also for those that are still lost in this world. We are most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt and to make times like this for believers, for we members of the body of Christ, just times to rejoice in. We do just ask your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, do all to the glory of God. Sunday. Sunday. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah, Todd, you might be right. Check one, two. Is that better? Yeah, but still, that's way up. Is the gain crank so high that it's like that? It's that sensitive? It's so massive. Check one, two. Balls you vocal cords. <laughs> Anyways, so Sunday's message, sorry online if your speaker just blew out. Um, Sunday's message was titled Freedom, Beauty, and Strength in Conviction. Uh, so the spirits had a lot to say uh, the last few weeks. Um, obviously, freedom, beauty, and strength in conviction was wonderfully placed, perfect timing. Uh, a bit long and a stretch for those with uh, SBS. Do you know what SBS is? Small bladder syndrome? People were dying. I saw this like fire strip from the AV room from a Todd to the bathroom. Anyways, it was well worth the time. Amen? It went about an hour and a half, which is exceptionally long for us here. Um, but it, the Spirit obviously just had a lot to say uh, in forms of, you know, just convicting us, but as well uh, encouraging us. Uh, and He didn't want to let us go until He could bring it full circle and encourage us. Um, during that message, though, the Spirit had me share a question that had come up in the Bible study that was basically, what about single women? You know, what about this whole idea of singlehood? Uh, and the context of the question was that the Bible has a lot to say about married women. And that's a true statement, fair enough. Um, but where does that leave single women, or men, for that matter? Well, as we noted on Sunday, Paul, a single man himself, had a fair amount of spirit-filled counsel to give on the subject of singlehood. For starters, go to 1 Corinthians 7.17. 7, we'll do a review. 1 Corinthians 7.17, 7, wonderful passage of Scripture, and very encouraging for folks that, you know, uh, might be, I don't know, just railed on or, or uh, wailed on by this world that, I don't know what the deal is, but people are somewhat delusional, uh, at least in America, on the topic of marriage, that somehow, I don't know, something's wrong in your life or failing in your life or, I don't know, um, something's off just because you, you're not married, which is redonkulous. 1 Corinthians <laughs> 7, 17, what does it read? It says, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. So, right out of the gate, Paul wasted no time in framing up. Now, this is what I want you to think about, okay? Because we know what's coming. We know that he gets into particulars. We know that because we just read this on Sunday. But what does he do right out of the gate? He gives us a framework. He, he, he settles us into the right perspective so that we have those more specific conversations in our own heads or with each other or from pulpit to, you know, the flock. Um, you're rightly situated in your doctrine, if that makes sense. You're grounded 
rather than what the world tells you, you're grounded in what Holy Scripture has to say. Here's your starting point, okay? And so he starts it that way. So he wasted no time in framing up proper perspective on the topic. I think it's fair that too many people just dive headlong into biblical doctrines without the proper theology to support their journey. You know? Dive headlong into biblical doctrines without the proper theology to support their journey. For example, I was thinking about this, um, it's a relatively easy habit to get into, for example, to forget whose glory you are to focus on while on this earth. That's a bad habit we all get into. Amen? Whose glory should we be focusing on while here on earth? To hell with marriage! Does that make sense? I don't mean that in the wrong context. I mean, it's, when I say that, I mean, to hell with your preoccupation with it. Is that fair? With this world's preoccupation, cracking it like a whip. It's disgusting. To hell with all that garbage that's got people all anxious and torn up and it's terrible. And so Paul does here what I've been doing from this pulpit, which is getting your perspective right. Okay? Here's what the Word of God has to say. 1 Corinthians 10, 31b, up here on the board. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's your starting point. Does that make sense? That is your starting point. If you don't have that nailed, you shouldn't be looking anywhere else yet. You should be focusing on that. Do all, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do. One of the great litmus tests that's come up from this pulpit for years now is whenever you're you know, at the crossroads, you're at that point in your life and you're about to make a decision, is what I'm about to do going to bring glory to God? Is what I'm thinking in this moment bringing glory to God? That's the easiest litmus test of all, isn't it? You know, it's a 99.9% of your... I don't know, questions in life day to day, if you just say, hmm, is what I'm thinking or about to do going to bring glory to God? If yes, then okay. If not, then don't. I mean, this is Holy Scripture. Whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. So I want you to hold your thumb there, and we're going to see some more Holy Scripture on this topic of whose glory we are to focus on in the now. Okay? And please, also, don't miss the connective tissue. Uh, back to our recent messages and blogs about shedding anxiety while attaining proper focus. Because it's all related. Go to Isaiah 42, verse 8. Isaiah 42, verse 8. So we're just going to spend a little bit of time just crawling the Scripture, looking for what Holy Scripture has to say about whose glory it is that we ought to be focusing on in the first place. Before we get into any specific discussions about anything social or anything you think that means anything to you in this life, what about whose glory are we to focus on? Isaiah 42, verse 8. I am the Lord. That is my name. You get it? My glory I give to no other. Any questions? nor my praise to carved idols. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. How about Isaiah 43, 7? Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Okay, any questions? How about Romans 11.36? Romans 11.36. Again, whose glory should we be focused on here in this life we're living? I think it's easy to forget. We have a really bad habit 
of focusing on self, for example, self-glorification. Romans 11.36, For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. You authored nothing. What are you boasting about? As if you didn't receive it. Anything good about you, I am what I am by the grace of God. Anything good about you was given to you by God. So how in the world do you end up losing focus on that? How does that happen? For from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. To Him be glory forever. Amen. How about Revelation 4.11? Revelation 4, verse 11. Revelation 4, verse 11. What does this say? Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Who's worthy? You? No, the Lord. We are not self-made men and women. Throw that in the trash. That's just some moronic poet that came up with some catchphrase that people like to cling to. Oh, captain, my captain, I'm the captain of my own ship. Shut up. You're a moron. Chances are you're probably rotten in hell right now. Hate to be cold. That's, your, that's probably where that particular individual is. How's that working out for you, oh, captain? You captained yourself right into the lake of fire. How's that working out for you? I hate to be pithy, but you can see there's a certain um, indignation in my voice that even carries over from Sunday. And just FYI, a lot of feedback on Sunday's message. Very um, heartfelt feedback. Like, this mattered to me. This made a difference in my life type feedback, that message on Sunday. So, again, who, whose glory are we to focus on? That's the framework. That's our starting point before we get into all the particulars that Americans like to argue and bicker about. As Christians, we can't, I can't speak for unbelievers. they got bigger problems. I'm here to teach believers presumably, and I'm charitably speaking because I never believe that uh, any church is without unbelievers in it. It's possible there are unbelievers listening to my voice right now. I don't know. But this is what the Word of God has to say to us, believers, children of, of God. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And finally, a passage that some of you will recall from my three-month sabbatical. I think this was Scott's favorite subject. Go to Matthew 5.13. Scott's like, "Uh uh-oh. I already know what that is. Getting the Morton salt shakers out. (laughs) Matthew 5.13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house." In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So they might see your good works, okay? And then you don't turn around and go, look at how awesome I am. 
because that would ruin the whole thing. No, no, no. Give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And you're to promote that. I am what I am by the grace of God. You think there's something special in me? Praise God. End of story. That's who we should be focused on. And we shouldn't allow others to refocus us on ourselves. Had a nice discussion with someone on that, too, via email, about that very thing, how easy it is, and I even wrote a blog on it this week. Um, actually, it's here in my notes. This week's blog is titled, Does It Even Matter? Does it even matter? The things you think matter, the things that you've been trained up to believe that matter in your own life. Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so smart. Oh, you're so whatever. Oh, you're so good at sports. Oh, you're so what? Right? And you hear that enough throughout your life, you actually start believing, guess what? It must really matter. And now you're a slave. And now it takes a time like this in your life, who knows, decades down the road, that God says, that enough's enough. That doesn't matter. That stuff doesn't matter. Where is your focus? So again, this week's blog is titled, Does It Even Matter? And it's meant to help this congregation out with this topic. I'll give you an excerpt from it up here on the board. Does it even matter? If you're boasting in something within the purview of Satan's scale of values, and you are doing so to boost your own self-esteem, that you are, then you are in the Spirit's crosshairs as you read this. You are in bondage because you think such things matter. You're in bondage. Because somehow you bought a lie, somewhere along the line you bought a lie, and now you're boasting about yourself. As if it came from you. If you have, as if you have something to boast about. The only one we should ever boast about is in Christ, is Christ himself. I mean, without him, we're just filthy rags. So all that stuff that you're worried about, whether it's marriage or relationships or money or reputation, whatever that stuff is, it's all secondary. The only reason any of us get hung up on it is because we lose our focus. Again, if you're boasting in something within the purview of Satan's scale of values, and you are doing so to boost your own self-esteem, then you are in the Spirit's crosshairs as you read this. You are in bondage because you think such things matter. So what's the fundamental issue here? Well, let's go back to Paul's good advice and see. Go to 1 Corinthians 7.17. I hate to be so uh, blunt right out of the gate this evening, but apparently you probably had to be jolted. It's a Thursday night, and some of you are like half in the bag, <laughs> right? So I got to like get all crazy. 1 Corinthians seven seventeen. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. So... Think about it. If God himself has called you to a life, a very unique and therefore special life, and as we just noted, for his glory, for his glory, what say you of any malcontent that exists in you in light of these facts? So he's given you this life to live. It's unique, therefore it's special, certainly in God's eyes. Whether the rest of the world gets it or not isn't the point. And he gave you that life to live after he saved you, nonetheless, for his glory. So you've been given this gift called life. What say you of any malcontent that exists in you in light of these facts? So here's our principle from Sunday up here on the board. The source of unhappiness. Malcontent is an incredibly destructive force. 
The root is a disrespect for God's choice in bringing glory to himself through your otherwise worthless life. The very best life for you is the one the Lord has, quote, assigned to you. 1 Corinthians 7, 17. That's the point. That's the very best life he has, in, has for you. It's the very best life you could possibly live. Of all the alternatives, the very best one is the one God gave you. Why would you ever be malcontent with such a gift? All right, let's press on with our review. Verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts nor any, for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. In other words, that was a big deal back then too, right? The whole circumcision gig. Paul's like, that doesn't matter. You guys are wasting your time bickering over this stuff, worrying about this stuff. Keep the commandments of God. Keep Him in full focus. This is His life. The Lord purchased your life for, for you to His glory. This oozes another doctrine that's been coming from this pulpit as of late, up here on the board, Proverbs 111, 10. Or actually, it might be Psalm, huh, Scott? Is that the one? Yeah, that's supposed to be Psalm 111.10. Scott had me change it, and I didn't change it. I did on the website. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you can't go any further until you have fear of the Lord, if you have any hope of gaining real wisdom in this lifetime. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. Paul's good intention, as mine is now, was to see those whom he loved delivered from their debilitating spiritual illnesses. You can say what you want about Paul, but he loved those people. Even though he knew that they loved him less, he loved them more, they loved him less. He gave more, they gave less. Am I to become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. These are all from Paul. He lived it, right? It's hard. It's easy to blow smoke. And everybody's like, yay. Give me one of those happy messages. You know, and everybody's on this diet of, you know, incessant uh, seeking of so-called encouragement, which is garbage, but I'll leave that for another day. Nonetheless, God, Paul's good intention, as is mine, was to see those whom he loved delivered from their debilitating spiritual illnesses, to be cured of their incessant focus on self, and to shift their focus and perspective to the rightful recipient of glory, namely the Lord God. That's all he was trying to do. Before we even talk about anything, O Corinthians, O Americans, where's your focus? Can we even have a good dialogue here? Will you even understand what the Spirit's trying to convey to you if I give it to you without first framing up the conversation? That's all I've, I've been doing this for 25 minutes now. We haven't even got to the point yet. Because that's how long it takes sometimes as a teacher to get the student body thinking correctly so that you can even teach them the actual main topic. Because they're so filthy from the world. They're not thinking straight. They come in with all this baggage. Do you understand? And sadly, not you guys for the most part, as far as I understand it, Sadly, a lot of people go to church to just get another pill. Give me the red one. Give me the green one. Give me the blue one. I don't care what color it is. Just give me something quick. I'm in and out. I'm in and out. I just need quick, 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 quick. It doesn't work like that. It requires focus, concentration, shaking off the self-life, leaving that stuff out there. So this is the fight. 
right? So that people are cured of their incessant focus on self and their focus and perspective is shifted to the rightful recipient of glory, namely the Lord God. So again, I ask, if God has called you to your unique, special life, then why not embrace it for all it's worth? Why not embrace it for all it's worth? Live in the now and be happy and content. And by the way, I encourage you to read the book of Ecclesiastes when you can, as a refresher course from the wisest man of his time, Solomon, and see what he has to say about all the things the world esteems, having gained them all himself. See what he has to say about it all, right? He's the same one who said there's nothing new under the sun, same book. Here's a hint for you up here on the board. Amplified Classic, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. I believe this is the second to last. It's one of the very last verses. It might, be, it might go to 12, 14, but if not, it's pretty darn close. This is pretty much the last thing he has to say. All has been heard. The end of the matter is. You ready? So after 12 chapters of writing down all these you know, experiments he went through, all these tests and all these, you know, tried that, been there, done that type things. This is what he said. All has been heard. The end of the matter is fear God. Surprise. Fear God. Revere and worship him, knowing who he is, and keep his commandments. We just read that. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole of man, the full original purpose of his creation, the object of God's providence, the root of character, the foundation of all happiness, the adjustment to all inharmonious circumstances and conditions under the sun, and the whole duty for every man. What's the whole duty? Fear God. Fear God. God. Impregnated in that is who gets the glory? Who deserves it? If you fear God, and fear has the idea of respect in it, it's overwhelming. You have to say, like the 24 elders said we just read in Revelation, you're worthy. <laughs> you are infinitely superior to anything I've ever done on my own. Everything I've done is just garbage. You take all the glory. You're the one worthy of it. That's your duty. Doesn't that just make life easy? Instead of jumping in the rat race, trying to prove something to yourself and to others, just give it all to God. Okay, back to Paul's sentiments. Go to 1 Corinthians 7.19. 1 Corinthians 7.19. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision but keeping the commandments of God. Did we not just read that? When all is said, fear God and keep his commandments. Did we not just read that? It's exactly what we just read. Imagine that. Nothing new under the sun. Keep, keeping the commandments of God. Paul drives his main point home. And just as a side note, notice how the particulars that people like to focus on aren't actually the real main theme here. Rather, they are symptomatic of being misaligned with the main theme of to God be the glory. That's the theme here. Therefore, look at verse 20. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. Don't close any doors either. You know, Verse 22, for he who is called in the Lord... As a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord, likewise he was free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price, remember that. Do not become bondservants of men, up here on the board. Glorify God by being you. This came out on Sunday. Don't dream about being someone else someday. Just be yourself today. Accept who you are and how God has made you. He didn't mess up. It's that simple. Just relax. Enjoy it. <laughs> this is how he made you. This is where he put you. Right? 
accept it. That's not a call to live in sin, by the way. Okay? That's not a call. To, I've seen that happen, too. I am what I am by the grace of God. And then they just run off in licentiousness. Right? They just run off. See, I am what I am by... God made me this way. God made me a tool. God made me a fill in the blanks. No, 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 no. Let's not mix here. Let's not go that route. So this is not a call to live in sin, obviously, but rather a call to embrace your calling in Christ Jesus, to live a righteous life, whatever that means in the context of your own personal pilgrimage. Pressing on, verse 24. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. Now, the next section of this passage deals with marriage. But we're not going to read it just yet. Again, because of this sensitivity, the high, I'll call it hypersensitivity, of marriage in our society. I have to frame it up. Okay? Is it fair to say that when it comes to marriage, Satan has done a bang-up job confusing the whole issue? Is that fair? Yeah? Nobody? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. A lot of lives are affected by, you know, marriages that just go awry. Um, but I'm going to say something now that's, I would argue, is controversial. Even for most Christians, most Christians, I would say, even what I'm about to say is controversial. It's because most Christians that I know if they even are Christians, are ignorant. They haven't read their Bibles. They haven't sought it out. They just go on emotions. They hear marriage, they think emotions. That's it. Oh, you know, it's emotional. It's when two people get together. They've been, you know, and everybody's throwing rose petals. That's marriage, right? Yay! Marriage is not about romance or, quote, falling in love. Rather, it's about bringing glory to God. I'll say it again. Controversial. Some people are like, what? Yeah. Marriage is not about romance or, quote, falling in love. It's about bringing glory to God. That's your baseline for marriage. One of the greatest deceptions ever played on humanity is in this area of living. Here's a question for you. If someone else, suppose everyone in here was single right now. If someone else were to choose your spouse for you, and you could never get a divorce... How comfortable would you be with that? Most of you would say, but I don't even love this person. It could be a total disaster. Is that fair? That would be most people's like, wait a minute. Somebody else is going to choose my spouse? I can live with this person until the day I die because there's no divorce? Just go with it. Did Adam choose Eve, or did God give her to him? Hmm. Did the Old Testament saints choose for themselves exclusively, or did their parents choose for them? Hmm. Am I suggesting, before you get all crazy on me, am I suggesting, suggesting you shouldn't be married to someone you love? Not at all. Not at all. What I'm trying to give you is proper perspective on the divine institution of marriage according to the one who instituted it for the sake of his glory. Right? That's the perspective I'm giving you. Again, perspective on the divine institution of marriage according to the one who instituted it for the sake of his glory. 
like I just said, marriage isn't about romance. It's about glorifying God in time. And I'm speaking specifically and strongly to believers. Okay? It's about glorifying God in time. It's not about this idea, this Hollywood idea, especially a romance novel idea of falling in love. It's about waiting on God's timing in the Spirit's guidance. When's the last time you heard anyone say that out loud? If ever. Honestly. Why does it take a guy like me, an unpopular guy to start with, to put that out there on the internet for hundreds or thousands of people to, to watch someday? Why does it take a guy like me in Timbuktu, Dighton? Do you follow? Shouldn't everybody know this? Shouldn't every Christian know this? Why don't they? Like I said, they're lazy. Marriage equals emotionalism. No, none of this is involved. Honestly, this is almost, is it fair to say in most Christian marriages, this is a prop. Fair enough? It's a prop. You know, they grab a couple of punchlines out of it. Be blessed and go on and say your vows. And it's, uh, it's kind of gross. So I ask, when's the last time you heard anyone say any of this, ever? It's always, oh, you know, we're so in love. You know, and they're like rock lullabies playing in the background <laughs> by Poison or someone with long hair. <laughs> you know, every rose. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is a joke. Right? That's the fantasy. Satan loves it. And you know how it goes. It lasts for the honeymoon phase and maybe a little longer. And then life sets in and the reasons they cited for getting married in the first place begin to sag and fade. And their fleshes begin gnawing at each other. And instead of bringing glory to God, they begin contemplating divorce even. For the record, here's what God has to say on that subject up here on the board. Malachi 2.16, New American Standard Version. For I hate divorce, says the Lord. I didn't say that. You have a problem with that, you talk to the Lord. I hate divorce, says the Lord. Take it up with the Lord. Divorce is the exact opposite of bringing glory to God. It's the exact opposite. And it has an especially large ripple effect when the rest of the world sees one of God's children partaking in it. As this week's blog alludes to, what's the message being sent when a so-called Christian gets divorced? What's the message Think of the grand design. I just taught you it. Of marriage. Marriage is meant to bring glory to God. What's the message you're sending when you're a so-called Christian and you get divorced? I'd argue the first thing a Christian antagonist would conclude, you know the ones who are always right at the ready, you know what I'm getting at? You know those people. Always looking for an angle on the Christian. Always trying to like. Their first thought, arguably, could be to conclude that Christ uh, or Christianity doesn't work. I guess that doesn't work, does it? And in their minds, they have another reason to badmouth Jesus. But that's enough of that. Okay? That's enough of that. That, unfortunately, is a lot of the mess that we get into when we don't focus on the glory of God when we get married. 
Those are the things, some of you are like, man, it's too late for me. Big deal. Big deal. That's not the point of this message. If you've got kids, teach them this. If you're still not married, learn it. Whatever. We're not here to be all guilt-ridden. You know? This, the truth is the truth. You, you know, raise your hand if you don't want the truth. I mean, this is the truth. I don't know what else to say sometimes, right? This is the truth. I can't cherry coat it because then I'd be adding or subtracting to the intent of God the Holy Spirit who authored this book. I don't have that right. So, you know, accept it, swallow it, but don't run away with your tail between your legs. Right? We all have problems. We've all failed. So get over yourself. Okay? Crack the idol. Because that's the real problem. You're still holding yourself up as some idol. But read the blog on that one. Anyways, I don't want to get too sidetracked. The point here is that even marriage is about bringing glory to God. Popular to con- to, uh, popular, or contrary to popular belief. Even marriage is designed to bring glory to God. That's how God architected it. Doesn't mean we always do it, but that's what it was designed to do. That's not popular. Look at verse 25. Now, concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord. In other words, Paul's using context to give advice here. But I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, whatever was going on in there, we don't know what it is. There's a context here, though. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. I think what he's really saying here is that you guys need to get refocused. You guys have lost your focus. You're worried about the wrong things. Let's reel it in. So stop the presses. Let everybody stay the way they are, and let's think about where your head's at right now. That's all he's doing, right? And this was wisdom speaking, using context as the backdrop. As a side note, I was thinking about this. Religious people like hard and fast rules, though, don't they? Because they can remain lazy. Synthesizing and analyzing situations takes work sometimes. You know what I'm getting at? In other words... Paul is doing something we should all do. We should take the time to analyze situations in our lives. Stop just looking for the easy way out. You know, and that easy way out may be, if you're a crafty little bugger, might be to take Holy Scripture and misappropriate it in the wrong way to a situation so that you can justify something ungodly. That's what religious people like. Just tell me what, you know, just give me the, you know what I mean? But it takes work to actually buckle down and ferret it out and pray and ask God for guidance. Turn the stupid TV off and pray. You got problems in your life? Throw that stupid thing in the garbage and pray. How about that? Instead of complaining about how God's not taking care of you, or this problem's that way, or this problem, or this one's that way, or this somebody in my family's this way, pray. You know what I'm getting at? People? You know. Verse 27. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. And this is what came out on Sunday. Okay, Those who marry will have worldly troubles. And I would spare you that. So this was where the Spirit helped address the question that arose from the Bible study. What about singlehood? Verse 29, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as those as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. 
For the present form of this world is passing away. In other words, all else pales in comparison to bringing glory to God. All else pales compared to bringing glory to God. What matters most is undivided devotion to the Lord. If you can't manage that yet, on your own, you shouldn't even be contemplating marriage. That shouldn't even be on your radar. Do you understand? If your focus isn't on the Lord, if you say you're a believer and your focus is not on the Lord, you shouldn't even be thinking about bringing another human being, joining that way with them. Yet. Can't say you can't get there. That's your business, not mine. But I'm like Paul, and that's all Paul's saying. <laughs> you guys have bigger problems. You've lost your focus. You're all worried about these things, and now there's a big uprising in the church. We've got problems. This current distress has infected our church. Right? You guys need to cut it out. Just stop. Go back to basics. Focus on the Lord. That's what he's saying. That's what I say to you sometimes. What matters most is undivided devotion to the Lord. If you can't manage that stuff, then you shouldn't be contemplating other things. Honestly. No matter how, like my air quotes, in love you think you are. Oh, but we're so in love. You're in love with yourself. I remember listening to, do um, you guys remember um, Paul Washer? You guys remember, I showed a video, I spent a whole class one time, and he was talking to young kids about the gospel, and he was fierce. You think I'm bad. This guy is fierce. And he tells a story about how a young man comes into his office, you know, a congregant, I guess he's been there for a while in his congregation, and he's like, I want to get married. He says, okay. Who are you marrying? So-and-so. Well, why do you want to marry her? Well, she's beautiful. And he's like, so he says, you know, you know where this is going, right? He's like, what happens when she's not beautiful anymore? What you're basically telling me is you're a selfish jackass. In so many words, that's what he told this young man. He said, all you're looking for is what she can give to you. But what happens when that thing she gives to you is gone? Then what? You're not, you don't want to get married under God. You just want to get married because you're a selfish person. This is what he told his kid. Guy's like, but that's real. You want to get married because the girl is beautiful and you, and you're, you love her? That's, that's why you love her? Because she's, she's, she's beautiful, she's attractive? That's basically just admitting that you're a selfish lover right out of the gate. And selfish lovers are the worst people that should be getting married because they're hyper-dependent on the other person to keep feeding them whatever it is that they have a hunger or a lust for. It has nothing to do with bringing glory to God. Amen? That was his point. You need to go back to the drawing board, young man. You need to rethink this thing out. This is, marriage is meant to bring glory to God. Not so you can have some trophy wife that brings glory to you at parties and social gatherings. And God forbid, what happens to your so-called trophy wife when stuff starts sagging off her body? Or she, she can't dye her hair anymore because it's bleached out and frayed like Einstein. No, for real, like what What happens? What happens if she, she dyes her hair so much her hair starts falling out? What are you going to do? You don't love her anymore? Why do you love her? I'm being funny because you guys are really uptight at this point. You guys are like, can we just get out of here? This is ridiculous. Right? But this is what this world has come to. And you, I know it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable. Imagine teaching it. You want to come up here? This is brutal. Right? But like I said before, the, the truth is the truth. Bless you. The truth is the truth. You either want it or you don't. 
You know? So Paul answers much of this for us. Why, why all this? Look at verse 32. This is his heart. You see his heart comes out now. I want you to be free from anxieties. I want you to be free from this crap. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and the interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he has, he is not behaving properly to what is betrothed, if his passions are strong, and it has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart, to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries as betrothed does well, and he who refuse, refrains from marriage will do even better. Again, there's context here, so this isn't doctrine. Always remember there's a context here. There was some kind of issue in this church. Okay? And sometimes this is what has to happen. Stop the presses, in other words. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. Only in the Lord, again, I said this on Sunday, believers are prohibited from marrying unbelievers. Verse 40 Yet, in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is, and I think that I too have the Spirit of God. So, here was the additional closing thought from Sunday's message up here on the board. <clears throat> Freedom in beauty and truth. It shouldn't matter if you're married or not. Your objective in this life is to behold the life the Lord's anointed you with and live it, playing your part. The beauty is in your faithfulness and obedience to the one whose personal glory is the object of your affections. That should be, that's what is beautiful. And in the process, you're set free. From what? Your own idol. Our biggest hang-up is us. We look in the mirror, and there's our idol. There's our numero uno idol. Is that fair? And what do we do for our idol? We elevate it. We do everything in our power to elevate it. We want to bring glory to the idol. Well, if the idol is you, guess what you're doing? You're spending your time and your energy on elevating self. And you can't do both. You can't glorify God and glorify self. That's the point. So if you really want to be set free, fear the Lord. Live it this way. It shouldn't matter if you're married or not. Your objective is in the life, or in this life, is to behold the life of the Lord's anointed you with and live it, playing your part. The beauty is in your faithfulness and obedience to the one whose personal glory is the object of your affections. So again, is what you're doing bringing glory to God? Is what you're thinking bringing glory to God? Whatever it is, that should be your focus. And if you have that as your focus, what the Bible tells us is you're set free. Because that's the truth. And the truth, what? Shall set you free. Imagine how that all works together. It's almost simple. <laughs> to summarize, up here on the board, your life on earth is best spent bringing glory to God, not yourself. That's the point. This is where you find freedom, beauty, and strength, to borrow from Sunday's message title, Got a couple of minutes here. For example, speaking of Ecclesiastes, are you convinced that this is true? Go to Ecclesiastes 3.11. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. It could be just after Proverbs. Ecclesiastes 3.11. What does it say? He has made everything beautiful in its time. And that's been the focus since Sunday. 
in its time. Are you convinced this is true, or do you still struggle with it? I think people don't seem to struggle with God's ability to make beauty. I think most people would concede that. The true test seems to be with his choice of timing. People lack patience, which is tantamount to saying people lack faith and therefore conviction. So, if you still need to be convinced and messages like this one just aren't cutting it, then do as Holy Scripture says. Go to James 1.5. James 1.5. I mean, don't take my word for it. I alluded to all of what James is about to, what we're about to read in James earlier, maybe 10 minutes ago, with prayer and such. James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. As we learned on Sunday, double-mindedness implies lack of commitment and therefore is an immediate show of a lack of faith. Lack of faith results in loss of conviction, which of course leads to instability, practically speaking. A more holistic way to think about this is that double-mindedness means an exit from the sphere of God to the sphere of ungodliness and death. That's where it takes you. You want to, you want to focus on your self-glorification and God's at the same time? See where that leads you. It's an impossibility. What does it say? It says the double-souled, double-minded, dipsukos person leads an unstable life. That's basically what that means in lay terms. And you ought to expect nothing from the Lord. What? Yeah, because you're just playing games at this point. You're just playing games. You don't have any real conviction. Right? I mean, it says in Holy Scripture, if you go to God, He gives freely and abundantly. Did we not just read that? So maybe you haven't been going to God. I just looked like a principal right there. Huh? <laughs> maybe. I have to do this, though. Maybe you haven't been going to God. Right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, maybe you haven't been going to God. I don't know. That's the only... Logically, what else is there? Just saying. Just throwing it out there. I mean, if, if there are promises in the Word of God and God's not a liar, God really, 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 really loves you, just throwing it out there, it probably has something to do with you. <laughs> right? Double-mindedness leads you to away from the sphere of God into the sphere of ungodliness and death. Real quick, double mindedness implies lack of conviction, making a person lukewarm by God's standards. Go to Revelation 3.15 quickly and I'll close. Got to be more sensitive to you SBS sufferers. <laughs> Revelation 3.15. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Up here on the board, true, st true strength lies in conviction. A person committed to the Lord is neither lukewarm nor double-minded. Conviction is born of integrity. For a believer, this integrity is to the word of God. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. Amen? All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this evening, for bringing us together, for always just cutting to the chase, Father. It's a tough pill to swallow sometimes, but it's necessary, and we are so very grateful for it, Father. We're the ones that are messed up. We're the ones that are screwed up, Father. You're perfect and holy. We're not about to suggest we bring you to us. We go to you for the truth that sets us free, Father. May we always remain 
in that type of humility. We do just ask for your blessings as we take the things we've learned back to the privacy of our own souls, our homes even, and then you will be done to a world that needs it so desperately. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thanks.